You're listening to Radio Free Satan. Enjoy the show. I would would like, like if I may, to take you on a strange journey. Welcome to... Let me move the mic over closer to me. Welcome to Nine Cents. <laughs> Nine Cents is a satanic perspective of our modern world. I'm your host, Adam Campbell. It is great to have you joining me again. AC. Okay, so it's May 13th. And I've got a great show for you this week. One thing that I need to make note, I'm not going to be editing any of my live portion of this. Uh, I say live because it's recorded live, as if it could be recorded any other way, but point being, I usually go back and edit the worst flubs out of the show. I'm not going to do that today, Uh, partly because it's Mother's Day and I'm trying to rush to get this podcast out so I can go spend the rest of the time with my uh, uh, baby mama. (laughs) I'm white, but I can still say that, right? And (laughs) you know, I just want to spend the day with my family. So... I'm going to try to rush this out, but I do have a really great show for you, and it's actually going to be probably a really long show, so bear with me. I've got a lot of things to cover. There's been a lot of things going on this week. So first and foremost, Art on You's Inkathon. Uh, I actually waited to go because last year there was a line, uh, and it served me well because when I got there, I was ready to be taken care of as soon as I got there. I do not recommend everyone waiting because then if everyone waits, then that kind of ruins the whole point of having the wait because then everyone shows up at the same time, you know. Anyway, I ended up getting a really awesome tattoo on just kind of like just an inch further down from my arm than my armpit. And that's on my left arm is where I got it last year. This year, a really great little paint palette with a little paintbrush, stylized clip artish kind of. Uh, the artist who tattooed me, uh, his name is Adam. Hey, and my name's Adam. What a quinky dink. He ended up shading it really nicely, uh, going above and beyond what was actually expected and told was going to happen. So rather than just doing a full black or an outline, he he really went to town. So I want to reach out and say thank you, Adam. Uh, You did a fantastic job. Uh, Other than bruising the shit out of my bicep, um, (laughs) just from the tender spot, it it was a lot of fun. I had fun there. It looked like they had a lot of people coming through, so congratulations to Art on You. I hope you did um, above and beyond what you were expecting. And it was actually tough, too, because they had they had cancer walks. They had Mother's Day weekend to fight with. So whatever they ended up doing, it's going to be great. And it's really, you know, goes to show that that's a powerful shop with a powerful community built around it. And that's that's always awesome. And it's Mother's Day today. Now, last year when I talked about Mother's Day, I went to this long rant about my mom and how she was this lesser magic um, witch, and she had no idea about it. (laughs) I don't think she's actually ever listened to an episode I've done. And I could actually tell her, I don't even know if she knows I do a podcast, to be quite honest. I could even tell her that she's been featured in an episode, and she would never still listen to it, on the off chance that I'm going to say the word Satan. <laughs> because she's she's Mormon. So, you know, it's a little... Hold on, let me close this window real quick. So it's a little bit weird for her to uh, deal with, even when I'm talking great things about her, to listen because she still sees it as this weird evil thing, which is really ridiculous. I mean, I could be sort of over the top satanic with this podcast, which really wouldn't be me, but and I would actually probably get a lot more listeners because it's what I think a lot of pretenders and a lot of pseudos expect when they hear that there is a podcast about Satanism. You know, they expect, like, lightning and thunder, I guess not lightning on an audio podcast, but thunder crashing in the background and uh, Takata and Fugue playing over me speaking and just a lot of... (laughs) And the occasional... That was a girl scream, in case you couldn't tell. You know, stuff like that, and a lot of uh, raising hell bullshit. Uh, That's really not me, and I would venture to say that's not the majority of Satanists, and that's uh, pretty much a shitty cliche. Now, there's nothing wrong with being Halloween-y. I think that's great, but let's recognize it for that and not Satanism. Anyway, that's what she would expect had she ever even thought about listening. 
So I'm not going to go into another... All of that was actually just for me to say that. I'm not going to go into another rant. Oh, it's going to be a long episode. Uh, today, I uh, took the wife and the kids to the Utah Renaissance Festival. And this is another thing I talked to you guys about last year, uh, that about this time. And this year it was a lot worse. Uh, really kind of crappy. I actually did get some pretty good jousting where the splinters of the jousting lances like shattered right into the camera, like right over me and my kids and my wife and stuff. It was actually a little bit freaky, but I got some video of that, so I'll be posting that if anyone is interested. Uh, reach out to me in some social networking site and you'll end up seeing it on YouTube or something. Pretty cool stuff anyway. But it was really hot out there. You know, I mean, one thing that really sort of drives me crazy about being a responsible parent is that you have to plan for things like this. So you have to make sure you have water. It's going to be sunny. you got to make sure that they have uh, either a hat, you know, something to shade over their eyes, or sunglasses. You have to make sure that they are literally dipped like a fish in batter before frying it in sunblock so that they don't burn and develop skin cancer and all the horrible things that, you know, you never want your child to endure. And snacks. You have to make sure that they can have something to eat if the chance arises that they want something. You also have to be able to fend off the constant. Can I have this? Ooh, look at that. Can I have that? Dad, please, 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 please. Let me have this. Let me have that. Oh, look at that. Let me have this. Constant. So you have to have a firm resolve as a parent when you go to any type of festival. Because really, I'm pretty sure all of these festivals are based around the idea not of entertaining people, not of having this sort of escape, get away into a total environment, but just to make some damn money. I'm realistic, and I think everyone who goes to these things is realistic and understands that that's the underlying principle. So you have people, and it's not like going to an amusement park or something. You have a lot of people standing in front of their booths trying to sucker you in to spend a dollar, or spend five dollars, or spend ten dollars on whatever junk that they're trying to pawn off on you. And every once in a while you'll see something really nice that you actually would be interested in getting until you see the price tag and you do the sort of like back of your head math and realize you could get it online or just anywhere else at a third of the price that you're being offered it at the moment. Um, just really crazy. And, and it's a little bit frustrating for someone like me where I just want to go and sort of be immersed in this total environment. And you're constantly being pulled out of it. And I say that, and this is something I spoke to last year too, and I'm going to have to reiterate quickly here. Unless you run into the goobers. <laughs> These are the basement dwellers I'm speaking of. Pasty white. The only reason why they're out here is because they watched Beastmaster 35 thousand times in a row and they just really want to express their uh, fantasy slash medieval self and then they try to speak in this broken I don't know if it's supposed to be Scottish or Irish or English or or just goober language but like I am literally in a ball cap t-shirt and jeans dragging around trying to shield my children's eyes from the bounty of junk that they are being you know shown at every damn corner and then you're going to walk up to me and be like good day sir how are you shut the f who are you i mean why would you even talk to me uh, it's just so aggravating i did have this really cool moment where i was almost <laughs> accosted by women which believe it or not does not actually ever happen <laughs> so it was kind of cool so there was this belly dancing i tell you what if i ever see a woman spinning around fire or shaking her belly with bells I will stop. I don't care what they look like. I will stop and I will watch it awe because I think that is incredibly sexy and beautiful and attractive and it just draws me in. So we saw this troop of belly dancers. And, it, okay, here, here's another thing I'm going to sort of step on quickly here. If you have a child who's belly dancing, that's cool, do their thing, but maybe keep them back from the ravenous goober horde that is going to drool over them at said Renaissance Festival. They're literally like 27 to 55-year-old men who have only seen boobs online, and they were all pawing their little dice-covered fingers <laughs> at this uh, really young girl. And it's, it's gross to look at, and it makes me uncomfortable because there are actually women dancing with them that you're really sort of into, and then all of a sudden this stupid little girl comes up and does her little thing. 
It's like, okay, well, if you're the father or the mother, you know, or a relative, and you're like, oh, wow, look at him play, yay. But if you're, like, lusting over this mature woman and all of a sudden a little girl pops in your frame of reference, it, like, ruins your day, man. So, <laughs> just saying, keep the kids home. It'll make sure that no goobers get attached to them, and then, you know, I can still enjoy the women who are actually doing an amazing job riling up my senses. <laughs> it was awesome, though, because they did this, like, maypole dance, and they needed someone to hold the maypole. So they came up and grabbed me, and I was sitting there, and I had all these belly-dancing women dancing around me, uh, uh, like, sort of making this maypole knot thing. I don't know. It was really cool, sort of, like, I, I almost felt like I was, like, kicked back out into, like, some Wicker Man-esque <laughs> moment. It was kind of neat. Uh, anyway, so that was the Renaissance Festival. Great jousting, great belly-dancing, and a lot of shitty people shelling their shit. <laughs> really. Uh, so how about we focus on what's coming up in the show, because I've been writing for 10 minutes and I haven't talked about anything here. This weekend I also helped some friends uh, sort of cleanse their house. Uh, I'm going to go into that a little bit, but what I want to talk to about in The Devil's Advocate is adjusting rituals and uh, ritualizing with friends. Um, you know, some t well, I'll get into it then. In the Infernal Informant, I'm going to talk about Fortune Teller told Mother to make children work as slaves, and this is actually, thank you Darren Deicide for posting it, from a social networking site. Uh, as I mentioned, Darren Deicide posted this, and I, I just have to talk about it. Great, great, interesting article. Massacre in Mexico deepens country's violent image is the next. And in Creature Feature, I talked with Les Hernandez, Warlock Bloodfire, from The Quintessentials. We're going to be talking about their new album that is out... <laughs> called Realm of the Great Old Ones, and you'll sort of understand that. And then, you know what, I, I probably am not going to have time, but I really do have a great Bizarre of the Bizarre, so I might I might squeeze it in, but I'm not going to mention it just in case we're way over. So uh, look for that next week if it doesn't happen this week. Either way, enjoy Nine Cents. We are here, back to our normal schedule. And, uh, oh yeah, you know what, before I forget, Los Escritores Satanicus. I didn't say it right, but <laughs> it's out there. Google it. Support it through Kickstarter. Kevin I. Slaughter is doing an amazing job with Own World Amusements, bringing this Spanish translation of the Satanic Scriptures. Support the Satanic Tome of the 20th century. 21st century, I should say. Anyway, another nine cents starts now. Say why bother? How you done? Great. Let's cut the bullshit and get real. Why this purity you feel about evil? For Christ's sake, why? It don't lie to me. I guess, father. You gotta feel that old nick in your soul, and it becomes clear. Like it did for me, the first time. That's when I realized my one true calling in life. And what's that? Shit, man. <laughs> I'm a born devil's advocate. Welcome to the devil's advocate. I'm a Satanist. I'm a member of the Church of Satan. But I do not speak for the Church of Satan. And that is all. All right, adapting rituals and ritualizing with friends that maybe aren't necessarily Satanists. Now, I have, uh, I have, I, I've actually mentioned this before. I came into Satanism uh, from the occult angle, from the occult road. I wanted to really sort of delve into it. It's just something I've always been interested in. And when I found Satanism, I stopped. Like that was it for me. I didn't need to go any further. Loved it. It was a part of who I was already, so uh, I, I didn't really have to look any further. But I still have that passion, and certainly I still have the friends that I had then, um, who are still <clears throat> didn't ever find themselves in Satanism, which you know is fine. I don't care, but uh, you still can't actually wrap their heads around it, which is interesting since it's been such a long time that we've known each other. And huh. anyway. 
they are still doing rituals and stuff like that. So they asked me to, you know, come in and you know, just sort of be a part of it. Uh, something I normally am a little resident doing. Uh, I laid out my boundaries of where, what I'm willing to do and where we're willing to go as long as certain things are met and that it's taken absolutely seriously. It's not a fucking joke. And that we are focusing and you allow me to bring my satanic aesthetic into it, uh, verbiage and such. So they consented. They really wanted me to be a part of it. And it actually ended up being great. But, you know, one of those things, or, or certainly, and I don't recommend anyone doing this if you're not a ritual practitioner anyway, but when you take into account uh, that these are not Satanists, you may, or at least I want to hold back a little bit um, as far as, you know, how much are you adapting from the Satanic Bible or the Satanic rituals or the Satanic scriptures? You know, I, I, I sort of look at who's going to be there. I put myself in their perspective, their worldview, and I adapt portions that I think would fit for that. Always, the whole time, keeping in mind that this is supposed to be a powerful emotional decompression. So, you're not supposed to be rationalizing at all. You're going into this just to expend energy in a direction of your de deciding. And whether or not they see it through the same lens as you, we still have a... <clears throat> excuse me... Uh, a common focus. Uh, so essentially what I was doing was adapting a compassion ritual to help them, in their minds, cleanse their home. And again, this is outside of the realm of the COS. This has nothing to do with anything. This is just me uh, helping out some friends in the way that I'm familiar. Uh, so I don't recommend anyone else. Uh, but, you know, just for the experience. You know, one thing you have to keep in mind is that uh, sometimes you have friends who aren't even interested in the occult. And so this was one of the fears that I had going into this and certainly agreeing to help them out in this way was that we were going to have some of our friends show up who are Christian. And there's no way I would be able to have that concentration, that focus, if they were there. Now, luckily they weren't, um, or else I just wouldn't have performed it. And, th and that sort of comes to, you know, let's relate this strictly to satanic rituals. If you are ever going to ritualize in a individual or group setting, or pair setting, you know, whatever, you want to make sure if there's going to be anyone present, uh, meaning anyone that could potentially interrupt you or participate, you have to have a common focus. You have to understand what you're going into and what you want to get out of this ritual. Uh, it's immensely important it, it's something that will, if you are not going to go into it with those understandings, and uh, if it's not solid with that ideology, then you're literally just performing a play. And what's the point of that? I mean, really, I mean, okay, I mean, to be fair, I, I'm a fan of masturbation, and if that's what this is in that scenario, emotional masturbation, uh, okay, I wouldn't be comfortable with it at all, and I don't recommend anyone ever do it, but if that's a choice that you're going to make, fine. What I would suggest more than anything else is not doing it at all. If everyone is not on the same page, just don't do it. Just don't participate. Y you are able to express your emotions in your own intellectual decompression chamber of your creation in the privacy and controlled environment that you live in. You don't have to do it in a group environment, and you don't have to do it with people who aren't going to take it seriously. Now, this is something to always keep in mind, because, you know, I've mentioned before, if you are a known Satanist, then you are going to be approached by people who want to, and either they're just curious, or they're genuine pseudos, and they just want a taste of the dark side. You know, the devil god as they see it. Uh, and so they're going to come up to you, and you just have to say, no, I, I'm not okay with this. It's going to take a little bit of lesser magic uh, to really divine their in true intentions, but you shouldn't be ritualizing if, you can't, if you're not capable of doing that anyway. So uh, we, we performed the ritual, and <laughs> it was funny because we had, uh, I mean, we realistically had to deal with the environment that we're, we're put into. 
Um, and, and it was an expressed understanding that they did not want to exclude their children or hide an event like this from their children. And so their children were not participating, but they were nearby, creating all sorts of noise and fun and everything. It created a more family environment than in a ritual chamber I've never experienced before, which is why it was really foreign to me and it was really kind of uncomfortable. But at the same time, you take a step back and you realize, well, this isn't your show. This isn't your event. You're here to provide emotional and structural support uh, for someone else. And uh, that's exactly what I did. And it ended up being something entirely different than I envisioned. But still, there was a catharsis at the end that I felt was very gratifying. I can't promise myself I'd ever do it again because of the unorthodox nature of it uh, at its core. But... You know, just a few notes. If you're going to ritualize with friends, make sure you're on the same page and make sure that you're okay with everything that's going to happen and don't don't compromise uh, the legitimacy of what you are doing and that's performing greater magic. I mean, the authority that comes with that. Don't compromise that um, to be liked by anyone or... Uh, to be on the good side of someone or just to be friendly because that's not what it's about if they're not going to give you 100% don't do it in this case it ended up really great I'm happy probably won't do it again but if you're going to do it maybe maybe this will help you all right so ritualizing is fantastic just uh, go into it with your head high and your eyes open let's move on to the infernal informant Okay, this is an article from the Telegraph. Fortune Teller told mother to make children work as slaves, and it was posted on 9 May. A mother made slaves of her two children and forced them to work for gypsies rather than go to school after a fortune teller told her it was the right thing to do. Within weeks of the meeting, Linda Clappison started locking her son and daughter, then aged 10 and 6, in their rooms and assaulting them. She fed them only sandwiches and took the light bulbs, toys, and all mattresses and bedding from their rooms, leaving them needing hospital treatment for frostbite. Clappinson, 46, of King and Marsh, East Yorkshire, was found guilty of two child cruelty charges at Hull Crown Court last month. She, this is like America-type weird. I'm a little bit surprised this is <laughs> overseas. She was jailed for 18 months concurrently or each charge. Judge Michael Medier, the recorder of Hull, described the case as tragic. Really? that He describes the case as one word. Tragic. Um, what about horrifying? What, what about the definition of sheep? Like, you can't get more sheep than that. You take the children that you created, that you brought into this world, and because some lunatic tells you to do something like, I don't know, make them slaves, lock them in their room, remove mattresses and light bulbs, and only feed them a sandwich a day... And you think that's a good idea? This is what happens when you have a worldview that consists of fairy tales and fantasy. What? I can't believe that... I mean, okay. So, I had this big tirade about atheism and stuff like that. So, I, I'm not going to go into that again. But let's just say, if uh, we could all get past this mythology that we've been sort of as a culture, a human culture, been living in for the past, let's call it 16,000 years, then maybe shit like this wouldn't happen. It's, It's infuriating that the mother is doing this. Happy fucking Mother's Day. He also praised the children who gave evidence against their mother. Yes. <laughs> Congratulations. Your mom is a nut job and you are strong enough not to back her up. The trial heard that the mother of four forced her two youngest children to work for gypsies as slaves after falling under the spell of a fortune teller. Oh, that is not the real defense, is it? Oh my gosh. 
Who? Let's throw the insanity plea out the window because now we have spells. Holy shit, this is straight out of 14th century mock court trials. I was called under the power of a spell. You must understand I would never normally abuse my children in this fashion, but the fortune teller had twinkly eyes. Holy shit. Under a spell. That's their serious... T- Why doesn't the justice laugh that out of court, throw her away, and do the ten-cent solution? A bullet to the head. I mean, that's what she deserves. She's abusing children. Her own children, nonetheless. <laughs> Holy crap. Okay, let's say you have a sick, actual sick livestock. Uh, we're going to use sheep for the obvious comparison. What if your sheep was sick and diseased and torturing the other animals? Uh, its own. You needed the wool. Hers wasn't worth the time, and the damage that she was causing to those around her wasn't worth it. Would you put her out of her misery? Fucking A right you would. And that's exactly what we should be doing to this sick woman. Uh, it, it's shocking, and I'm gonna call out you Brits over there, man. Uh, UK, stand up. Come on, do not let this crap. Okay, I'm not even halfway through this article here. This is gonna be a long episode. Uh, Forced her two younger to work for gypsies. Uh, her son, Andrew Clapson, now aged 18, told the trial, We were treated like dogs. Uh, okay, well, let's say it's some of the nutty dog lovers here in the States. I'm a fan of dogs, but there's some people that take it way too far. That's actually not a bad thing. So it's sort of a relative statement. Let's, I mean, is in England, I don't know, are animals, like, treated horribly? Like, are dogs, like, treated just terribly? Because that, I would understand that statement if that's how, if that's how they were treated normally. But... I mean, hell, some people put their dogs in sweaters and carry them around in handbags and give them raw meat. I mean, that would be a little weird, but at least you're getting protein, right? (laughs) Okay. After her daughter, now aged 13, told the court her mother had shaved her hair at least five times as punishment, really? You'd think after the first time you'd be like, okay, well, she's just going to do it again. You've sort of been on that ride before, you know what I mean? Like, does it really have the same impact? Your head, your hair is like a literally like an eighth of an inch long, but you were talking back about not liking to be locked in this cellar of a room, so I'm going to shave your head again. Not entirely sure that's a powerful statement to make as a parent. Uh, anyway, Clappin said the girl wanted to look like Britney Spears. <laughs> Thank you, Britney Spears. You have (laughs) influenced the world. That's a legacy you should be proud of. Judge Medier told her, This is, in many ways, a tragic case for all those concerned. Really? In many ways? How about in every way? I love this pussyfooting around that people do. Nobody sitting through this trial, as I did, could fail to be moved and impressed by your four children. Quote, they were the sort of children that any parent thinking clearly and sensibly would admire. They were measured sensibly and pleasant. Uh, That's a credit to them rather than to you. This is him talking to her, not me talking to you. You. Uh, (laughs) They have somehow survived what you have put them through and turned out well. You know what? I got to tell you, this speaks exactly to what I've been saying for years since I started having children and being a paranoid parent, and then really sort of taking a step back and realizing what the hell was going on. We are so worried that listening to the wrong music in the womb, or showing the wrong TV show, or letting them play a video game is going to mess them up. This lady locked her kids in a cellar-like environment. Like like a wine cellar-like environment. I mean, the description I got from that was just sort of wet, damp, cold. I mean, they almost had pneumonia. So it was this horrible, torturous environment. She shaved their heads, made them work as slaves, and they still ended up okay. Admired for their behavior and for their cooperation in such a a twisted situation. So you can't tell me that just because you don't want to take your kid out skating the second they want to go skating, somehow you're a bad parent. Or putting them in daycare, or, or letting them... I don't know, fail on their own two feet at times? I 
with every success, you have to allow them to fail, too. Like, somehow that's going to be the one thing that makes them horrible in life. Hell no. This is proof of that. So listen up, parents. Stop freaking out over every stupid little thing. Take that stupid bike helmet off. Yeah, that's right. Bike helmets. I hate them. Knee pads and everything. If you're going to learn to stand on your own two feet, you're going to fall sometimes, and it's going to hurt, and you're going to get scabs. Big deal. And let's say, worst case scenario, your child doesn't make it. Maybe, and this is actually a really harsh thing to say, maybe they shouldn't make it. Are we going to want a bunch of, like we have now, entitled, spoiled little children who cry at every scratch as our future? No! We want people who are capable of fighting through pain, still going to work if they have a cold. Not being shut down because they've got a hangnail. Like my, <laughs> every gym coach I ever had and every uh, uh, after school program coach I, I'd ever had, walk it off. <laughs> that is what we should be telling our kids, not, oh, it's okay, you tried your hardest, even though it wasn't good enough. Is it really okay? No. No, it's not okay. Some people are good at some things. Other people are good at other things. Stop the participating awards and stop pandering to your own children. You don't need them to like you. You need to be able to treat them with respect and have them be uh, treating you and everyone else in the world with respect. And I tell you what, learn to overcome a little bit of adversity, like, I don't know, uh, not kissing their knee when they scrape it when it's not bleeding. Maybe that'll build a little bit of character. A little uh, intestinal fortitude. And that's what's missing. All right, uh, let me let me get off my soapbox here because I'm not even done with the article yet. All right, uh, the judge said he could not help but have sympathy for Clapson because he believes something had happened in her life to make her think in a strange and illogical way. You know what it is? It's called Christianity. It's called believing in an invisible man because that opens up the door to being what mesmerized by a. Uh, <laughs> Being, uh, having a fortune teller cast a spell on you and you treating your own blood like, well, in England, like dogs. <laughs> Unbelievable. He said he had no way of knowing if the changes were due to the meeting with the fortune teller. He added, uh, I am satisfied that something changed and changed with disastrous consequences. Well, I'm glad you're satisfied. The court heard the Clavinson had still not admitted the offensive, instead insisting that her children were liars, and that she would never consider a reconciliation. Unbelievable. See, the sheep doesn't want to play nice. Put her down. He said the children with great fairness so that there was a long period when you were a perfectly good mother, caring and, if anything, overprotective. Ah, so, let's make an illogical leap and say that overprotectiveness leads to slavery. Hmm, see? Not good. And that, this is a quote, then something went very, very bad, wrong, and they said badly, wrong in your life. And your mind, it caused you to change and treat them in a way that you did. Why is the judge trying to justify her actions to herself? This doesn't make any sense. Listen to the evidence and read her the verdict. Like, like stop, you're not her psychiatrist. Who cares? We don't need your explanation. He added, It is sad that seeing your children in court giving evidence did not in any way melt your heart. Who cares? This is your opinion and it doesn't freaking matter. Send her upstate. Uh, jailing Clappinson, Judge Mattier said, You blighted the lives of those children and only custody can be justified. That was a weird last closing statement from the judge who... Uh, I don't know who wants to be a psychiatrist. All right, England, uh, you have just stepped up to being as freaky as America. Congratulations. The next article. Uh, this is from the Christian Science Monitor. Massacre in Mexico deepens country's violent image. Yeah, they need a massacre for that. 49 bodies were dumped on a highway in northern Mexico in the latest example of drug-related violence that is scaring off investors and changing citizens' behavior at home. Ooh. This is by Sarah Miller Leona Lelana, uh, May 13th. Hey, Mother's Day. 
49 bodies have been dumped in a highway in northern Mexico, and by the time the world wakes up Monday morning, the herring, this is future telling apparently, the herring image will have been beaming across the globe. Thanks to Nine Cents Podcast. You're welcome. <laughs> Mexico's drug violence has been a public relations nightmare for President Felipe Calderon. The, just his name. I feel like he is so ingrained in, and this is probably just my own racist <laughs> interpretation, but doesn't like, that's like a total drug dealer name. Felipe Calderon. Who are you getting the heroin from? I said Z, I don't know what. Uh, Felipe Calderon. He's giving it to us. You wait, it will come. Right? <laughs> like, okay, well, he's the president. Upstanding young man. The crime scenes inevitably make world news scaring off would-be terrorists and causing foreign investors to think twice. Yeah. Yeah. It was this 49 bodies that had scared off investors and foreigners. Because nothing in Mexico's history has ever wanted people not to want to go there before. (laughs) But imagine being a resident of one of the cities where violence is playing out. (laughs) We don't have to. We have movies. (laughs) That's... Talk about a disassociated world. We have movies that are literal portrayers uh, portrayers of this actual article. And having seen it, yeah, I can sympathize. (laughs) I I watched Antonio Banderas. (laughs) Wow. What a totally disenfranchised, uh, distanced world we live in. Uh, that is what happened to Carolina Gomez, a young teacher, who happened... <laughs> Why is every... Huh, that's kind of weird, right? Like, every name in this article that sounds kind of Spanish in Mexico. Weird. A young teacher who happened to drive past a similar scenario in her home on Veracruz in eastern Mexico, with 35 bodies were left under a highway overpass in the middle of rush hour traffic last September. She had been on her way to a tutoring job after school. The monitor provided her family in a cover story, profiled her family, after the ways that violence is impacting Mexicans not directly swept up in it. The dumping of the bodies was a tipping point for the city of Veracruz but also in the personal story of Mrs. Gomez. As a teacher, she had heard cases of parents kidnapped and even seen a corpse left outside of her school. This is, this is like Middle East type shit. This is, it's shocking that it's so close. I mean, how, how good do we have it? Really? That, that something as horrific as going to your tutoring gig, you run across dead bodies and that you just turn your head because it happens all the time. I, I, I would really love all these Tea Party freaks and these Occupy Wall Street uh, whiny assholes to really, I don't know, maybe go out of country for a little while to see how good we actually have it. I, I'm so tired of hearing how horrible our country is and how bad it is for all, you know, our future is so horrible, everyone's so disenfranchised. Shut up! St- at least you don't have shit like this happening. Really? Your, your daughters are going to school without acid being thrown in their face, right? And I know the answer. It's rhetorical. And that's pure reason to shut up. You got an iPad in your hands and you're down at Occupy Wall Street complaining <laughs> that the, the wealth is not being spread around. Where did you get that? Like, how can you stand there? I get, like, homeless people? Okay, maybe, uh, maybe they didn't mess up their own lives. <laughs> and they were just, I don't know, the byproduct of a messed up economy. Maybe, maybe some of them have the right to bitch. But you, you in your cargo shorts and your manicured nails, shut up. All right, I'm talking about Mexico, right? <laughs> Uh, Okay, so she never left home, including on this day, without checking Twitter first to map out the safe routes. I mean, could you imagine that? Your daily commute commute, commute is based entirely around whether or not you're going to have to run into the cartel or dead bodies. It's messed up. The scene caught her off guard, and it forever changed the way she viewed her city. It was the afternoon. It was on heavy traffic thoroughfare. It was next to an upscale mall and movie theater. It made me feel like no place was safe. Alright, that was a terrible accent. 
she told the monitor. In the most recent... It made me a thea- Okay, this is a girl. It made me- oh, I'll give it up. Uh, the victims, who were first mutilated, including six women, women, were found near Monterey uh, on the highway that heads to the U.S. border. How sick do you have to be? Or, conversely, how messed up do those women have to be that, in someone's mind, it was justified to mutilate them and then leave their body out on the street? I mean, that is messed up, right? The identity of the victims is not yet known. The scenario fits the patterns of drug trafficking rivals. <gasps> drug trafficking? That's not the Mexico I know. <laughs> Through the Nuevo Leon state, Attorney General Adrian De La Garza told the Associated Press the victims could also be migrants who were en route to the U.S. The deadly Zetas gang, also behind the surge of violence in Veracruz, purportedly took credit for the act in a banner left at the scene. They... <laughs> I'm imagining, like, a Kinko's banner. Like, they went and printed this banner. Uh, This massacre brought to you by Zeta's gang. And, like, they dump these horribly scarred bodies and, like, take time to make sure the banner can be seen and it's, like, tied up on the ends. And there's one guy back, Oh, bring the left a little higher. Oh, this is good. (laughs) Okay, that was a little Russian, not so much Mexican. Uh, Still a funny thought. Uh, as is the case in Veracruz, where hundreds of commuters passed by the scene, surely public officials and first responders were not the only ones to bear witness. Both incidents, while among the worst in President Calderon's six-year war on drugs... Hey, we got one of those. I wonder if it has anything to do with that violence. Hmm. Is sadly not isolated. In this month alone, 23 bodies had been either strewn or hanging off bridges and underpasses. All right, I got a solution. Hold on before I even finish that sentence. Let's remove all bridges and underpasses, which would, you know, sort of be a byproduct of the bridge removal, uh, in Mexico. And then the Zetas gang will have nowhere to put their banners and no way of hanging bodies. Problem solved. Thank you. Thank you. Please, please, please. Stop the applause. (laughs) All right, I'll stop being retarded. I've got a fly that is bugging the shit out of me. How did I even get in the house? Uh, Okay, so... Both incidents were among with their bodies strewn uh, across the country, underpassing the border city of Nuevo Laredo. Laredo. Across the country in Guadalajara, 18 more were also found on a highway. Police officers have been killed and piled up on public roads in uh, Michoacan. Sorry for brutalizing that name. The list could take up this entire space. The Mexican government takes great pains to explore, explain to the world that violence is, in most ways, contained. Really? I mean, do you just straight up lie when you say that? Or are you trying to convince yourselves? Because no one else in the world is believing it, brothers. No one. They say the far majority of victims are rival drug drug traffickers, not innocent victims. And the violence tends to play out in hot spots, not in the humdrum communities of Mexico. And especially, they say, not in places that tourists would want to go, such as Cancun. But events like that in Monterey would make it hard for Mexico to erase its image, no matter how the statistics are thrown out there. And the numbers mean next to nothing to those who are living in the violent context context. In a national survey headed up by Mexican researchers last year, 61% of Mexicans said they stopped going out at night. 30% say they no longer drive the state or national highways because of fear of drug trafficking violence. 22% say they stopped going to public events like concerts or sporting events. If there's an upside to living where the streets no longer feel safe, it's a sense of community that is formed where there was once none. Gomez said she walked into her students' home uh, pale faced last September and was handed a glass of water. She quietly told the children's mother what had just happened away from young ears, and the mother, whom she barely knew, offered her a ride home so that she wouldn't have to drive alone. It was a small act of kindness, but one that she remembers months later. Strangers have turned to one another for help because of all this. All right, I cannot do a Latin accent, uh, she said. Okay, so that's it. So, big surprise. Mexico has drug violence. Huh. Who would have thunk? Not, uh, not me. Let's move on to Creature Feature. Oh, God. No. Just me. <laughs> Did you know that after the heart stops beating, the brain can function for well over seven minutes? We got six more minutes to play. 
Why are you screaming when I haven't even cut you yet? Welcome to Creature Feature. Welcome to another Creature Feature. Today I am being joined by a friend of the show and personal friend, I'd like to think, uh, Warlock Bloodfire, otherwise known as Les Hernandez. How are you, man? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on again. Oh, it is always a pleasure. And I, I wanted to, I, I believe I reached out to you as soon as I heard that Realm of the Great Old Ones is available and pre-ordered it. This is something that if uh, listeners have been paying attention, uh, if they listen to more than one of my shows, they probably heard me talking about uh, last time. And I, I think it was somewhere October-ish, maybe, that we were uh, talking last, and you sort of alluded to this coming out uh, in, in the near-ish feature. Well, it's here now, uh, or on the verge of being here now. So I really, really wanted to talk about this. Uh, really exciting. I've heard some of the teaser tracks that you've released to social networking sites, and uh, just amazing stuff. I mean, really, really good stuff. It's like every every album, and I, uh, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself here, but just to make a note, it seems like every great artist, uh, you can feel a progression of not just quality of the, the music as they're making it, but I, I don't know if it's an overall feel of an album. Uh, also has a, a specific voice, and, and I think from what I've heard so far, uh, this is is really on par with that, and you are really uh, you know doing a, a fantastic job at something you've already, always been great at, uh, but you know taking it to that next level, which is really exciting. So uh, you know, before we get into the album specifically, maybe we can talk a little, rap a little bit about uh, yourself. I mean, you've had a, a, a recent move, uh, which has got to play havoc when it comes to producing, you know, writing songs, producing music. So, uh, how was that move initially? Uh, well, when it comes to the record itself, it was probably the best choice I could have made. Um, I've always been recording at Lowbrow Studios out in Kailua, on Oahu. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, the couple of studios that I recorded at in Oregon, in Portland specifically, um, just didn't have the same vibe, same capabilities. So I kind of wanted to stick with uh, somebody who knew the sound that I was after that you know I've worked with, and yeah. uh, so it slowed things down a little bit, but it, it's for the best. Nice. Yeah. Do you think that has anything to do with just a cultural connection that you have from having grown up there and started uh, Quintessentials and even Crawling Chaos before that, or is this something? Uh, you know, maybe it's just a music thing. The, the the scene in Portland just just couldn't connect with you like they can in in uh, Hawaii. Um, maybe partially both, but more so uh, the studios that I've seen in Portland. A lot of them were kind of just half-assed thrown together. Mm-hmm. Whereas uh, uh, my engineer Dimitri, who records us and uh, produces all of our records, he uh, really takes his his job seriously as an art form. Uh, because he's also a musician, playing in a, a couple of different projects, and um, he, you know, went away to school for the whole uh, Pro Tools thing, and and he's constantly upgrading. If you've seen this guy's mixing board, it's like, yeah. <laughs> oh my god, you could, I don't know, you, you could like uh, use it as a diving board or something. It's just, <laughs> it's huge. It's like, probably like five feet wide. And, oh and my god. Maybe three feet deep it's it's, it's insane but um yeah. yeah he he uh hand built his entire studio from the ground up oh yeah uh, so the guy really knows what he's doing um uh, inside and out and um i i don't think i could trust anybody else that's amazing well let's let's talk about sort of the, the genesis and and maybe even the um the concept behind Realm of the Great Old Ones, really quick, if we can. When did you first start writing songs that you knew would come together as Realm of the Great Old Ones? Oh, God. I don't think it ever <laughs> happened that way. It, it just it didn't happen that way at all. Um, basically, Realm of the Great Old Ones is two discs. Uh, the second disc is uh, actually our first album completely redone from scratch. Oh, hell yeah. Uh, when our first album came out, I loved it. It was great, but I felt, you know, it could have been better. There could have been a lot more power behind it. Um, and now I finally got that, uh, you know, I mean, that first album came out in 2001. Mm -hmm. So it's been, uh, just over a decade 
and it's about time it, it is re-released the way it was supposed to be. So I figured, rather than just put out uh, two albums this year, I'll just put them together into uh, into a double album. And uh, on the first disc, some of those songs actually go back to 1993 with my first band, The Catalogs. Oh, man. And uh, and a couple of those songs go back to uh, me and Mike Silva, Walk, uh, Walk Mike Silva's uh, yeah. band, Crawling Chaos, that we did in, like, 96. So, uh, yeah, a song called uh, What of the Vanquish, the very first track, and the very last track, uh, The Hollow Eve, uh, were written by Mike. Oh, wow. Uh. Yeah. Remastering from your, your very first album, what do you think, I mean, a decade is a really long time as a musician. I mean, there's bands that... Are, are born and die in less time. Yeah. So, <laughs> as, as a musician, what do you think? What do you think you learned in in that decade in order to uh, make the 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 re-recording of the initial album better or or just a better quality? What, are there a few things or? Well, it was all in production um, consistency. Mm-hmm. When we did the first album, uh, we did we, we used like three or four different guitar amps on various tracks and a couple of different guitars. I wanted to keep everything consistent um, on every song. We used the same settings and the same amp and guitar. Um, this time, I played all the guitars rather than having a second guitar player come in, uh, <laughs> which, I've, which I've been doing from our second record on. Yeah. Um, and there was some subtle changes uh, to a couple of the songs that, um, you know, you listen to something over and over and you go, hey, you know, maybe I could have done this here or that there. And so I kind of took took advantage of that opportunity, and uh, yeah. So you've been thinking for a while about re-releasing the the first one, uh, just sort of remastered. For at least uh, for at least five years, yeah. And, and uh, it was more than just remastering; it was like completely recorded from the ground up. Wow. Yeah. What I did was um, uh, Eric uh, Warlock Hell of All Hells, um, whose music people should go check out if they haven't heard it yet. Yeah. Seriously. Um, yeah, the guy. The guy's an amazing talent. Um, I sent him the first album, and uh, he mapped everything out, timed it, recorded all the drums for me, and uh, that's what I took into the studio. That's what you're going to be hearing. Oh yeah, yeah. So really good drum sound, amazing drummer, and uh, always a pleasure to work with. Uh, he he did all the drums, thirty six songs. <laughs> so <laughs> <Shit>. yeah, <laughs> the guy's amazing. <laughs> So, I mean, 36 tracks, two albums, this is a huge chunk of, of music uh, for for anyone. Um, I mean, do, did you ever think of, of scaling it back or, or maybe breaking it out and releasing it as maybe Realm of the Great Old Ones Part 1 and then Part 2? Or I mean... It, I kind of toyed around with that idea, and uh, I just decided, you know, I mean, how many punk rock bands put out double albums? Like... <laughs> that, that's that's something you hear from bands like Kiss. <laughs> so I figured, well, you know, if they can do it, why can't I? So, <laughs> mm-hmm. hell yeah. Well, it, it's certainly I think uh, original to the genre, but um, uh, great, great, great music. Yeah. Okay, so and it's cheaper <clears throat> for the fans. Yeah, and you gotta love that. So maybe, maybe let's talk about, I mean, when, when did you have this thing wrapped up where you started saying, okay, it, it's safe now, this thing is going to happen. Um, let's start doing some pre-orders um, through uh, Hawaiian Express Records. Uh, that was um, maybe about two weeks before the uh, scheduled release date. And at the time, everything was going on track. Mm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know how that goes. Yeah. Um, I'm very fickle about sound uh when i know things can be done better i want them done better i'd rather put out something that's at least to the best of my capability if not perfect mm-hmm. uh then then uh live with dealing with the fact that i put out something less than i could have yeah. so um curse of so, an artist man <laughs> yeah, yeah so so as things got uh, down to the wire there uh i mean we're mixing 36 songs uh which could have been done if uh, you know I wasn't the only person booking studio time, but you know people have to make livings and, and other people got to do their records and they have their own deadlines, so uh, things kind of slowed down there for a little bit. Um, it's almost completely done, uh, 
basically we only have to uh, raise some vocal levels uh, and master, and then uh, that'll be it. And we're also waiting on uh, the studios getting a, a new mastering um, uh, gadget, and uh, so that's going to improve the overall sound as well. And uh, hopefully, those who are waiting uh, will find the wait worth it. Nice. Well, I I know I'm not the only one who pre-ordered the album, and uh, we did actually get an email from Hawaiian Express Records explaining that you know there was going to be an unfortunate delay, and please be patient. So, you know, at, at least there was uh, some form of customer service reach out, which is always important um, when you're dealing with, you know, at times, uh, you know, first time first time purchasers through them. So that was really cool. I thought. Yeah, Jason's uh, Jason from Hawaiian Express. He's he's an old friend of mine. We go back to like probably around 93, 94. Um, and um, he's he's always been a big help to the, the Hawaiian punk scene. And uh, we, you know, we've, we've uh, worked on shows together, um, uh, co-promoted, whatnot. He's always been supportive with it. He's the guy who got our records on uh, uh, interpunk.com. Oh, yeah. And uh, so he's um, always on the ball, um, I guarantee you the day he gets them in is the day they ship out. Nice. Uh, he's just that kind of guy. So That's good. Yeah. Uh, straight shooter. <laughs> Definitely. All right, let me, uh, I, I teased it earlier, let's go ahead and play uh, Howl Eve, let the uh, audience really enjoy this track, and then uh, maybe we can talk a little bit about the influence and uh, why the album was called The uh, Realm of Great Olds and such, so uh, stick around, people. <laughs> was Hallowed Eve. 
let's talk a little bit about the the name Realm of the Great Old Ones. What inspired that? Uh, well, obviously H.P. Lovecraft. Mm. I'm a huge fan of H.P. Lovecraft. Um, a lot of people don't realize how much uh, Polynesian culture, I guess, might have influenced uh, Lovecraftian style tales, if not Lovecraft himself. Um, it was certainly prominent with uh, August Derleth when he took up the mythos. Uh, but with Lovecraft, um, I think he knew a little bit more than, than some people would uh, expect because there was a, a place around at the time in Salem, I believe, called the Peabody Museum. And they had a, a, a Polynesian exhibit. And I'm pretty sure that's one of the uh, places he got a lot of his information from uh, in uh, in uh, the Shadow Over Ensmith, mm-hmm. he talks about um, uh, deep ones coming from the originally being found in the Pacific Islands, and he mentions words uh, that are like local to Hawaii, called you know Kanaka, which are the, cool. the, the natives, and uh, things like that. So, and he places really in, in the South Pacific. Uh, these things kind of actually tie into Hawaiian culture. Being born and raised in Hawaii, uh, you hear about um, the four major gods in Hawaii. Uh, the uh, the squid god, the Cthulhu-esque god, uh, being Kanaloa. When the uh, when the missionaries first arrived, they heard about Kanaloa and immediately equated him with the devil. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, the so indigenous gods has got to be evil. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so you know, the whole squid god, uh, uh, that, that comes from the sky, from space, basically. So mm-hmm. it, it totally ties in with the Cthulhu mythos, and um, being that we're a band rooted from Hawaii, uh, and, and that I'm so into Lovecraft, I just kind of tied it all in together and thought it would it'd be appropriate to, you know, call it Realm oh, of yeah. the Great Old Ones, you know, that's, that's kind of Hawaii. <laughs> I, I have to say, like, some of the... When you're talking about cultures who have created a mythos and maintained it for thousands of years, I'm not talking about two like the Christian, but I mean literally tens of thousands of years of this same mythos. There's, there's, you know, when we walk into that um, belief and uh, experience it, there's more of an authority to it, I think, at least in my perception, Mm -hmm. than there is, you know, coming into Christianity or or anything like that. So, uh, it just feels good. Like, like it's it's like this dark, ancient chaos, just like Lovecraft has, you know, speaks to, so it's no surprise at all that he would be influenced by that and and even referenced directly. Oh, Um, yeah, exactly. And and it's amazing because this uh, this particular, like, Polynesian uh, religious culture, uh, it's so pervasive throughout Oceania uh, when uh, when the uh, missionaries came over basically all um, all roots all uh, traces of Hawaiian religion were wiped out <laughs> but but because uh, it's so pervasive uh, throughout the Pacific uh, Samoa um, uh, Tahiti whatnot New Zealand uh, you can still trace it back um, if you know the words, and, and, and you know the myths are all virtually identical. Um, so they might have wiped everything out from a small group of islands, but mm-hmm. it's still thriving elsewhere, uh, like Kanaloa, uh, the the one that inspired Cthulhu, in my opinion, mm-hmm. uh, is also known as like a uh, Tangaloa, um, Ta- Tangaroa. Uh, just depending on where you go, the dialect changes a little bit. Yeah, uh, but I mean, it's, just it's, phonetically speaking, that it would be easy for for someone like Lovecraft to just well, that's a lot of consonants. I'm just going to throw. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> throw it and in it's there. Funny for... because um, I, I had asked someone uh, when I first uh, kind of seen the ties. Uh, I had asked a Samoan uh, girl, and I was like, "Do you know who Kanaloa is? Have you, have you ever heard of this?" Uh, because I just wanted to see what the Samoan. Uh, uh, perspective was, and she just kind of went off on it, like really <laughs> facts and well, I mean, you know, their their myths and 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 pronunciations and, and this and that, and yeah. so I just kind of sat there, like taking it all in, and, and <laughs> it kind of became an obsession. <laughs> That's really really cool. I love that that the 
I, I love that even though you could be in a place uh, like America, which is really sort of a melting pot and people end up just sort of shaking loose their, their cultural heritages, that oh. there's some communities that still maintain it and still maintain. You know, I mean, like you were talking about the, the missionaries coming over and, and wiping out or, or attempting to wipe out these devil beliefs that the natives mm-hmm. had. You know, how can you, how can you really wipe out a spoken word? You know, yeah, well, most of the traditions <laughs> were oral anyway, and uh, like when I was uh, going to elementary school here, uh, we were required to take uh, Hawaiiana classes mm-hmm. and, and you know basically learn uh, how to how the Hawaiians lived, uh, um, how their their societal structures worked, their religions, and I grew up uh, maybe three blocks away from the Bishop Museum, which is right next to uh, one of the one of the libraries out here. So that's basically like that was like my home away from home, uh, yeah. and uh, so yeah, it's. Yeah. Well, <laughs> let's talk a little bit because I mean, you you had come, and, and maybe this is just me speculating or, or injecting here, but it seems like you you, you came from a very rich cultural background uh, into uh, <laughs> what. <laughs> I've never lived in Portland, but I've heard. Um, I, I know a lot of people who have moved there and uh, stuff. So I, I wouldn't necessarily call it a culturally um, rich area. I mean, it's really just, in my opinion, college kids go there to just bum around. <laughs> like, that's the stereotype yeah, of it? Yeah, that's, that's kind of Portland. I uh... So, I mean, what is that like going back to maybe, you know, the homeland? I mean... It, were you really, really connected with your heritage, and, and was it sort of a homecoming, or you know, just like this? Oh, definitely emotional. Definitely. Um, it was emotional. It was, uh, it was. I mean, it's a really rich place. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so when I got back here, it just it was like falling into a plush pillow. It was just <laughs> you know everything fit again. Nice. Uh, whereas in Portland, um, I mean. Just about all of the all of the people I would consider awesome people have left. Oh, really? <laughs> you know? I mean, there are a couple of, like a couple of people that are still there that have lived there for so long they're never going to leave. Yeah. But um, yeah, for for a while, uh, Portland was kind of fun, and and it just it's it's not the same. I mean, there's there's the whole hippie thing. You have uh, uh, <laughs> all all the. Uh, Garbage kids, uh, garbage girl kids <laughs> holding their signs, <laughs> asking for money, smelling like crap. You know, it's just it's yeah. horrible. I I got off the plane and I was walking around downtown. Um, I see. I left here on uh, uh, the third of July, two thousand six, to to go to Portland. So my first day day there, everything was closed. It was the fourth of July, and I'm walking around downtown Portland. Everything's closed, and there's nothing but kids begging for money. Damn. And, and I was like. I was really kind of taken back because you don't see that in Hawaii. I mean, if you see a kid on a corner asking for money, they're probably just asking for a quarter or something like that. You know, maybe mm-hmm. they, they want to go out and get a Big Mac and their ass is fat or something. But um, in Portland, they're like, hey, you got five bucks? Come on, I know you got five bucks. And I was like, five bucks? <laughs> I can get a job. I don't even yeah. have the time of day, motherfucker. <laughs> exactly. So it's like I mean, the audacity of asking for like, Anything more than, than spare change. Yeah. It, it's just, it kind of makes me feel a little bit violent. God, <laughs> I tell you, that is so indicative of, and this is going to be a little bit insulting to my own um, my own background here, but that, it is so indicative of, like, this privileged white culture. <laughs> I, I feel like I shouldn't, I, I, I need to, like, get a tan before I say something like that, but, like, seriously, like, y- you are just this privileged kid who ends up moving somewhere else refuses to get a goddamn job just wants to bum around and, and I'm going to make some broad generalizations here uh, do drugs, drink and just not do anything not contribute at all and instead of contributing you're going to make a conscious decision, you know what, I'm actually going to sap energy yeah. and resources out of everyone else and I mean Portland seems to be again, I'm speaking of it uh, a little bit of informed uh, from from people I know, but mainly out of ignorance, a, a culture where 
it, it's uh, encouraged. It's accepted, and everyone's even the state itself is like sort of encouraging it in ways. Well, I just yeah, I, I kind of have a hypothesis about about things like that. Um, well, two ideas. The first idea being okay when uh, when Europeans first came to the United States. Well, you know, America, North America. Mm-hmm. Uh, to get from the east coast to the west coast, uh, some people didn't want to travel that far. They were comfortable on the east coast. They settled. They were still very close to their their English ties or European ties. Mm-hmm. So they they were more prim and proper and, and uh, uh, conservative. Mm-hmm. Uh, as you travel further west, uh, the filthier elements kind of drop off. <laughs> And land in places like, uh, you know, the Bible Belt, uh, Backwoods Mountains. They settle there and lose their teeth. Uh, <laughs> by the time you have the last remaining few, <laughs> by the time you have the last remaining few that make it all the way to the West Coast, they've had so much trial and tribulation that they are, they don't care what people do as long as they're left alone. So they become very liberal. So... Mm-hmm. On the West Coast, you see all, you know, places like Oregon and, and whatnot. I mean, the hippie movement started in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. Um, so you see a lot more liberal ideas coming from people on the West Coast and a lot more conservative ideas coming from people on the East Coast traditionally. And I think it was that little migration that, that had a lot to do with it. Uh, speaking <laughs> specifically of Portland, uh, you mentioned, you know, broadly um, the, the privileged white kids uh, bumming out, doing drugs and all that, yeah. being hippies. Um, but, uh, there, there's also a large black population that will refuse to work and do drugs, but you don't see them as much bumming on the streets because they are more likely to rob you. (laughs) 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 They don't have the courtesy to ask. (laughs) They're more entrepreneurs. They're not going to wait for it to come to them. (laughs) They're going to go get the money they didn't earn. Or they're trying to to scam the system, you know, and, uh, for oh, Jack, uh, but that's you know it's it's <laughs> it, it's cross cultural. You know, if you want anything done, ask a Mexican. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! <laughs> well, <laughs> were there, let, let, let's uh, maybe uh, step back from our our cultural comments here. <laughs> Uh, all hate mail uh, directed toward <laughs> Les directed Mendes at. It's <laughs> a melting pot. That's what we do for fun is we make fun of each other here. So yeah, yeah. It's, it's not a big deal. <laughs> yeah, no, and, and I think I, I think that's par for the course for for anywhere. It, it, it's only the, the the truly uptight, ignorant assholes that get pissed off when you know they hear someone joking about their race, ethnicity, gender, etc., and get actually upset about it and even then i think it's fake oh, yeah. yeah. So, I, I mean I, I you know i there's there's a, a few people in the punk rock scene here um that like like black dudes that make fun of themselves and, mm-hmm. and uh um portuguese jokes for some reason are huge here wow. i i don't i don't really i never got it but <laughs> and it's it's just it's it's a hawaii thing mm-hmm. and um filipino jokes samoan jokes it, it's just <laughs> And, and nobody takes it seriously. Uh, it's it's just part of life here, you know. Yeah, I think as the the more comfortable you are with with who you are, and maybe even the more self actualized actualized you are, uh, stuff like that just rolls off your back. It doesn't matter, you know. You you can self deprecation, whether it's you specifically or your background. I think it's part of being a healthy human being. Yeah, yeah. You take yourself to too seriously, and, and nobody else will take you seriously. You know. Yeah, for real. So. A little ironic there. Um, okay, so let's talk about some. Are there any memorable moments um, during the compilation of the, this album here, this this two CD album? Um. Springing it on you, I know. <laughs> oh boy, let's see. Uh, well, this, I mean, I've actually been in the process of recording this particular album since probably around 2007, wow. maybe. Uh, yeah, that's when that's when we got Eric to, to uh, start recording the drums. And then uh, in 2009, I uh, came in and did all the guitars 
and vocals for the second disc, not knowing at the time that it was going to be a second disc. Mm -hmm. um, and then maybe a year or two later, uh, Eric did all the drums for the first disc. Wow. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, so everything is just kind of like, you know... <laughs> the man's a machine. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so it's uh, it's been quite a few years in the making. Mm -hmm. uh, when when this is done, I'm, I think I'm just going to have to like jump in and try and put out another album before I get too old. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you actually have contributors to this album that aren't... Nec you know, the, I mean, like Tibby X, for example. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, how did that come to come to be? That that was just really cool of her, really. Um, Tibby uh, had emailed me, God, like in the early two thousands, I believe, uh, because she she liked the quintessentials, and mm -hmm. uh, I really got into the X Possibles. <laughs> And uh, then we didn't talk for a number of years, and uh, we just kind of lost contact. And we started talking again, I believe, on Facebook. And uh, I was just, uh, I think there was a, a typo or something on her page that I had messaged her about. And I said, you know, by the way, if you ever, you know, want to come out to Portland or something, if you're ever going to be out here, uh, would you mind, you know, if you want to jump on a song that would... That, that, uh, pretty awesome mm -hmm. and she was like well sure I can be out there in like uh, about two months <laughs> and, uh, I was like okay cool you know is that coincidentally or she like <laughs> made an appointment to go out um you know I'm not really sure uh, oh. she was traveling with her husband and, and their their son who's adorable <laughs> and um so I'm not sure if it was a business trip or they just came out to see friends because I knew they knew people in Portland anyway mm -hmm. But um, I, I'm just glad that it worked out, and oh, cool. uh, it was it was fun. It was it was really fun. Oh yeah. Um, what do you think would be the distinguishing mark that she made on on that track, and um, that track actually uh, that, that's Devil's Henchman, right? Yeah, yeah, Devil's Henchman. Um, she added more of a chaotic level. I'm very, uh, how do I put this? I'm very neat and orderly in how I place things in songs. Mm -hmm. And she kind of went at it and took it by the throat. And I was like, that's <laughs> what we needed, you know? Oh, yeah. uh, she told me a story where, where she uh, she was practicing the track, uh, practicing the vocals yeah, while working out um, in one of the gyms somewhere in New York, I believe. In, in her building, maybe I'm not. I'm not even sure. Right. But uh, some guy walked in and just she scared the shit out of him. And he just kind of <laughs> turned around, and took off like like one of those crazy chicks screaming to the top of her lungs. And, you know? <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, that fun story. Cool. But, uh, yeah, so we got her on this. Uh, we got uh, Rob Benny on keyboards uh, on. Um, Midnight in the Black House and the Hollow Eve. Yeah. Really, really creepy keyboards. Uh, we've got Eric on drums, uh, two songs written by Mike Silva. The cover art, uh, Daniel Bird, Reverend Bird. Um, yeah, we actually spoke briefly about this in the last time we talked. Um, seeing it, it's an amazing painting. Yeah. Did you uh, give him any direction? I kind of said, you know, it'd be kind of neat if we had like this, this Hawaiian looking witch or Polynesian looking witch. Uh, casting a spell like over a cauldron, mm -hmm. uh, kind of a tiki vibe. But I didn't tell him specifically what I wanted. Um, there's a symbol though on the. If you look closely at the cauldron, there's a symbol there. It's an alchemical mm -hmm. symbol for decompose. And the reason I wanted that there specifically was because I'm uh, I'm a really big fan of the uh, <laughs> that cheesy '80s movie Spellbinder. I don't and think I've <laughs> ever even seen that. Uh, Kelly Preston stars uh, as the, the one of the leading characters in there. Oh, yeah, John, John Travolta's Scientologist wife. <laughs> <laughs> she actually makes a really good witch in this movie. And uh, that's not a very well-known symbol, and everybody thinks it's the symbol for Jupiter because it kind of sort of resembles the number four, but it's 
distinctive. And it's uh, something I wanted to uh, put a little bit more recognition into, mm -hmm. I suppose. Um, and so, so that's the background on that. And uh, yeah, when, when he shot me uh, the file with the, uh, the cover art, uh, the, the painting itself, I was just blown away. Uh, mm -hmm. he, Polynesian features were just perfect. Um, just the way the colors were done, the form, insane. The, the guy's a genius. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's he's seriously talented. And, uh, I don't know, he's got a, a really great uh, aesthetic as well. So yeah, he's uh, this isn't a, this isn't the first time I've worked with him either. Um, on a, on a personal level, um, I've commissioned paintings off of him. I I got a replica of the. Uh, uh, St. Patrick's Cathedral on Fire from Rosemary's Baby. Oh shit, really? Yeah, I got that done by him and uh, a replica of uh, the painting of Adrian Mercado. Yes. Rosemary's, but with myself in the painting. <laughs> <laughs> Less <pretty> Mercado. <laughs> and it's pretty cool because the pedestal that he's resting his hand on the books on, uh, the pedestal itself, he turned into like this tiki totem, which is really cool. Oh, that's awesome. I'm, I'm really happy about those. Oh yeah. Well, let's uh, let's close this up with um, you know what? we're going to close this up with the Devil's Henchman since we've been speaking to it. And uh, before we do, where can people go to pick up this album, Realm of the Great Old Ones? Uh, they can order right now via uh, hwnexp.com. Mm -hmm. um, there are no other links up to order it right now because. The album isn't officially out yet, but it will be in probably about a week, I would say, at the most. Cool. Um, but if they want, they can pre-order. Uh, if they want to wait, they can wait. Uh, and when it's officially out, I'm going to be posting links everywhere on thequintessentials.com, on our Tumblr, on our Facebook, uh, just everywhere. Hell yeah. Well, I've been I've been shelling for a lot of projects lately. Um uh, you know, some projects that aren't finished and stuff like that, but uh, I don't need to do shelling for this because Quintessentials are just badass all around and, and <laughs> people should just be picking them up because it's, it's fun. You know, you, there's some music you listen to for a certain atmosphere. There's some music you listen to um, to pull you out of a mood. The Quintessentials is just like feel-good music. Like any time of day, I think it's great. Uh, you know, it, it, it's good stuff. Uh, thank you so much for joining me, Les. It's always a pleasure talking with you. I hope uh, I hope we can get together here soon. Yeah, definitely. Um, gonna be well, but I'm going to try well, to figure well, out a way to go down to Hawaii sometime. <laughs> well, a source a source tells me that I may be seeing you next year anyway. Mm. All right. Well, yeah, maybe uh, maybe somewhere where a lot of people tend to gamble. Yeah, I'm so. I'm very very <laughs> down with that, and we'll keep it as mysterious as that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. All right, man. Well, you have a fantastic night. We're gonna. Exit the interview here with the Devil's Henchman. Hail Satan, brother. A villain is said to be bad, but an apathetic drone is far worse. A villain must be stigmatized so that his opponents can be considered heroic. These heroes are simply reactors who implement a change in affairs, sometimes mistaken for progress. What sets human reaction in motion? A force which is either intrinsically or contrivedly considered evil.
Oh, yeah, you got to love that. Quintessentials. Uh, go pick up the album right now. It's, I think, still on pre-order. I'm anxiously awaiting a couple more tracks to be uh, tuned up, and then it's going to be out. So, great band. Uh, Les is always a, a fantastic interview, and a uh, really great guy anyway. All right, so you know what? That's going to do it for another show. Uh, hope you enjoyed it. I know it was long. I was going to do a Bizarre the Bizarre, but it's just too long, and you know what? I'm spending way too much time here and not with the wife, so... Uh, I would love to hear from you, however. Visit the website 9centspodcast.com and send your correspondence to info at 9centspodcast.com. Let me know of any suggestions, critiques, corrections, complaints, <laughs> or general comments you might have. You can visit the Satan Net, Facebook, Google+, Twitter, or MySpace page for 9 cents and get updated on weekly topics. Listen to the show at RadioFreeSatan.com or download the show Monday nights via my RSS feed found at 9centspodcast.com. You can also subscribe via iTunes by searching 9 cents. Don't forget to leave your rating or comment. Again, support the Kickstarter for Los Escritores Satanicus, the Spanish translated version of the Satanic Scriptures by Peter H. Gilmore, our high priest. Uh... Do what you can for a, a fantastic translation of a book that really, it's, it's one of a kind. All right, so if you would like to learn more about the Church of Satan, visit churchofsatan.com. And if you'd like to hear other fine satanic voices, music, or personalities, visit radiofreesatan.com and online streaming radio station. Once again, thank you for joining me. And as always, I'm your host, Adam Campbell. And for this very unedited version of Nine Cents, until next week, hail Satan.